Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter twenty two. The Great Barn and the Sheep Shearers. Men thin away into insignificance and oblivion quite as often by not making the most of good spirits when they have them as by lacking good spirits when they are indispensable. Gabriel lately, for the first time since his prostration by misfortune, had been independent in thought and vigorous in action to a marked extent, conditions which, powerless without an opportunity, as an opportunity without them is barren, would have given him a sure lift upwards when the favourable conjunction should have occurred. But this incurable loitering beside Bathsheba Everdeen stole his time ruinously. The spring tides were going by without floating him off, and the neap might soon come, which could not. It was the first day of June, and the sheep-shearing season culminated, the landscape, even to the leanest pasture, being all health and colour. Every green was young, every pore was open, and every stalk was swollen with racing currents of juice. God was palpably present in the country, and the devil had gone with the world to town. Flossy catkins of the later kinds, fern sprouts like bishop's croziers, the square-headed moschatels, the odd cuckoo-spit, like an apoplectic saint in a niche of malachite, snow-white ladies' smocks, the toothworth, approximating to human flesh, the enchanter's nightshade, and the black-petalled doleful bells, were among the quainter objects of the vegetable world in and about Weatherbury at this teeming time, and of the animal— the metamorphosed figures of Mr. Jan Coggan, the master shearer, the second and third shearers, who travel in the exercise of their calling and do not require definition by name, Henry Frey, the fourth shearer, Susan Tall's husband, the fifth, Joseph Poorgrass, the sixth, young Cain Ball as assistant shearer, and Gabriel Oak as general supervisor. None of these were clothed to any extent worth mentioning, each appearing to have hit, in the matter of raiment, the decent mean between a high and low caste Hindu. An angularity of lineament and a fixity of facial machinery in general proclaimed that serious work was the order of the day. They sheared in the great barn, called for the nonce the shearing barn, which on ground plan resembled a church with transepts. It not only emulated the form of the neighbouring church of the parish, but vied with it in antiquity. Whether the barn had ever formed one of a group of conventual buildings, nobody seemed to be aware. No trace of such surroundings remained. The vast porches at the sides, lofty enough to admit a wagon, laden to its highest with corn in the sheaf, were spanned by heavy-pointed arches of stone, broadly and boldly cut, whose very simplicity was the origin of a grandeur not apparent with erections where more ornament has been attempted. The dusky, filmed chestnut roof, braced and tied in by huge collars, curves and diagonals, was far nobler in design, because more wealthy in material, than nine-tenths of those in our modern churches. Along each side wall was a range of striding buttresses, throwing deep shadows on the spaces between them, which were perforated by lancet openings, combining in their proportions the precise requirements both of beauty and ventilation. One could say about this barn what could hardly be said of either the church or the castle, akin to it in age and style, that the purpose which had dedicated its original erection was the same with that to which it was still applied. Unlike and superior to either of those two typical remnants of medievalism, the old barn embodied practices which had suffered no mutilation at the hands of time. Here, at least, the spirit of the ancient builders was at one with the spirit of the modern beholder. Standing before this abraded pile, the eye regarded its present usage, the mind dwelt upon its past history, with the satisfied sense of functional continuity throughout, a feeling almost of gratitude, and quite of pride, at the permanence of the idea which had heaped it up. The fact that four centuries had neither proved it to be founded on a mistake, inspired any hatred of its purpose, nor given rise to any reaction that had battered it down invested this simple grey effort of old minds with a repose, if not a grandeur, which a too curious reflection was apt to disturb in its ecclesiastical and military compeers. For once, medievalism and modernism had a common standpoint. The Lancelot windows, the time-eaten archstones and chamfers, the orientation of the axis, the misty chestnut work of the rafters, referred to no exploded fortifying art or worn-out religious creed, 
The defence and salvation of the body by daily bread is still a study, a religion, and a desire. Today the large side doors were thrown open towards the sun to admit a bountiful light to the immediate spot of the shearer's operations, which was the wood-threshing floor in the centre, formed of thick oak, blacked with age and polished by the beating of flails for many generations, till it had grown as slippery and as rich in hue as the state-room floors of an Elizabethan mansion. Here the shearers knelt, the sun slanting in upon their bleached shirts, tanned arms, and the polished shears they flourished, causing these to bristle with a thousand rays strong enough to blind a weak-eyed man. Beneath them a captive sheep lay panting, quickening its pants as misgiving merged in terror, till it quivered like the hot landscape outside. This picture of today, in its frame of four hundred years ago, did not produce that marked contrast between ancient and modern which is implied by the contrast of date. In comparison with cities, weathery was immutable. The citizens then is the rustics now. In London, twenty or thirty years ago are old times. In Paris, ten years or five. In Weathery, three or four score years were included in the mere present, and nothing less than a century set a mark on its face or tone. Five decades hardly modified the cut of a gaiter, the embroidery of a smock-frock by the breadth of a hair. Ten generations failed to alter the turn of a single phrase. In these Wessex nooks, the busy outsider's ancient times are only old. His old times are still new. His present is futurity. So the barn was natural to the shearers, and the shearers were in harmony with the barn. The spacious ends of the building, answering ecclesiastically to nave and chancel extremities, were fenced off with hurdles, the sheep being all collected in a crowd within these two enclosures, and in one angle a catching pen was formed, in which three or four sheep were continuously kept ready for the shearers to seize without loss of time. In the background, mellowed by tawny shade, were the three women, Mary Ann Money, and Temperance and Soberness Miller, gathering up the fleeces and twisting ropes of wool with a wimble for tying them round. They were indifferently well assisted by the old maltster, who, when the malting season from October to April had passed, made himself useful upon any of the bordering farmsteads. Behind them all was Bathsheba, carefully watching the men to see that there was no cutting or wounding through carelessness, and that the animals were shorn close. Gabriel, who flitted and hovered under her bright eyes like a moth, did not shear continuously, half his time being spent in attending to the others and selecting the sheep for them. At the present moment he was engaged in handing round a mug of mild liquor, supplied from a barrel in the corner, and cut pieces of bread and cheese. Bathsheba, after throwing a glance here, a caution there, and lecturing one of the younger operators who had allowed his last finished sheep to go off among the flock without re-stamping it with her initials, came again to Gabriel, as he put down the luncheon to drag a frightened ewe to his shear station, flinging it over upon its back with a dexterous twist of the arm. He lopped off the tresses about its head, and opened up the neck and collar, his mistress quietly looking on. "'She blushes at the insult,' murmured Bathsheba, watching the pink flush which arose and overspread the neck and shoulders of the ewe where they were left bare by the clicking shears, a flush which was enviable for its delicacy by many queens of coteries, and would have been creditable for its promptness to any woman in the world. Poor Gabriel's soul was fed with the luxury of content by having her over him, her eyes critically regarding his skilful shears, which apparently were going to gather up a piece of flesh at every close, and yet never did so. Like Guildenstern, Oak was happy in that he was not over-happy. He had no wish to converse with her. That his bright lady and himself formed one group, exclusively their own, and containing no others in the world, was enough. So the chatter was all on her side. There is a loquacity that tells nothing, which was Bathsheba's, and there is a silence which says much, that was Gabriel's. Full of this dim and temperate bliss, he went on to fling the ewe over upon her other side, covering her head with his knee, gradually running the shears line after line round her dewlap, thence about her flank and back, and finishing over the tail. "'Well done, and done quickly,' said Bathsheba, looking at her watch as the last snip resounded. "'How long, miss?' said Gabriel, wiping his brow. 
Three and twenty minutes and a half since you took the first lock from its forehead. It's the first time I've ever seen one done in less than half an hour. The clean, sleek creature arose from its fleece. How perfectly like Aphrodite, rising from the foam, should have been seen to be realised. Looked startled and shy at the loss of its garment, which lay on the floor in one soft cloud, united throughout, the portion visible being the inner surface only, which, never before exposed, was white as snow, and without flaw or blemish of the minutest kind. Cain Ball! Yes, Mr. Oak, here I be. Caney now runs forward with the tar-pot. B. E. is newly stamped upon the shorn skin, and away the simple dam leaps, panting over the board into the shirtless flock outside. Then up comes Mary Ann, throws the loose locks into the middle of the fleece, rolls it up, and carries it to the background as three and a half pounds of unadulterated warmth for the winter enjoyment of persons unknown and far away, who will, however, never experience the superlative comfort derivable from the wool as it here exists, new and pure, before the uncouthness of its nature whilst in a living state has dried, stiffened, and been washed out, rendering it just now as superior to anything woollen as cream is superior to milk and water. But heartless circumstance could not leave entire Gabriel's happiness of this morning. The rams, old ewes, and two shear ewes had duly undergone their stripping, and the men were proceeding with the shearlings and hogs, when Oak's belief that she was going to stand pleasantly by and time him through another performance was painfully interrupted by Farmer Boldwood's appearance in the extremest corner of the barn. Nobody seemed to have perceived his entry, but there he certainly was. Boldwood always carried with him a social atmosphere of his own, which everybody felt who came near him, and the talk, which Bathsheba's presence had somewhat suppressed, was now totally suspended. He crossed over towards Bathsheba, who turned to greet him with a carriage of perfect ease. He spoke to her in low tones, and she instinctively modulated her own to the same pitch, and her voice ultimately even caught the inflection of his. She was far from having a wish to appear mysteriously connected with him, but woman at the impressionable age gravitates to the larger body, not only in her choice of words, which is apparent every day, but even in her shades of tone and humour, when the influence is great. What they conversed about was not audible to Gabriel, who was too independent to get near, though too concerned to disregard. The issue of the dialogue was the taking of her hand by the courteous farmer to help her over the spreading board into the bright June sunlight outside. Standing beside the sheep already shorn, they went on talking again. Concerning the flock? Apparently not. Gabriel theorised, not without truth, that in quiet discussion of any matter within reach of the speaker's eyes, these are usually fixed upon it. Bathsheba demurely regarded a contemptible straw lying upon the ground, in a way which suggested less ovine criticism than womanly embarrassment. She became more or less red in the cheek, the blood wavering in uncertain flux and reflux over the sensitive space between ebb and flood. Gabriel sheared on, constrained and sad. She left Boldwood's side, and he walked up and down alone for nearly a quarter of an hour. Then she reappeared in her new riding habit of myrtle green, which fitted her to the waist as a rind fits its fruit, and young Bob Coggan led on her mare. Boldwood fetching his own horse from the tree under which it had been tied. Oak's eyes could not forsake them, and in endeavouring to continue his shearing at the same time that he watched Boldwood's manner, he snipped the sheep in the groin. The animal plunged. Bathsheba instantly gazed towards it and saw the blood. "'Oh, Gabriel!' she exclaimed with severe remonstrance. "'You, who are so strict with the other men, see what you are doing yourself.' To an outsider there was not much to complain of in this remark, but to Oak, who knew Bathsheba to be well aware that she herself was the cause of the poor ewe's wound, because she had wounded the ewe's shearer in a still more vital part, it had a sting, which the abiding sense of his inferiority to both herself and Boldwood was not calculated to heal. But a manly resolve to recognise boldly that he had no longer a lover's interest in her helped him occasionally to conceal a feeling. Bottle! he shouted in an unmoved voice of routine. Caney Ball ran up, the wound was anointed, and the shearing continued. 
Boldwood gently tossed Bathsheba into the saddle, and before they turned away she again spoke out to Oak with the same dominative and tantalizing graciousness. "'I am going now to see Mr. Boldwood's Lesters. Take my place in the barn, Gabriel, and keep the men carefully to their work.' The horses' heads were put about, and they trotted away. Boldwood's deep attachment was a matter of great interest among all around him, but having been pointed out for so many years as the perfect exemplar of thriving bachelorship, his lapse was an anticlimax, somewhat resembling that of St. John Long's death by consumption, in the midst of his proofs that it was not a fatal disease. "'That means matrimony,' said Temperance Miller, following them out of sight with her eyes. "'I reckon that's the size of it.' said Coggan, working along without looking up. "'Well, better went over the mixin' than over the moor,' said Laban Tall, turning his sheep. Henry Frey spoke, exhibiting miserable eyes at the same time. "'I don't see why the maid should take a husband when she's bold enough to fight her own battles, and don't want a home, for tis keeping another woman out. But let it be, for tis a pity he and she should trouble two houses.' As usual with decided characters, Bathsheba invariably provoked the criticism of individuals like Henry Frey. Her emblazoned fault was to be too pronounced in her objections, and not sufficiently overt in her likings. We learn that it is not the rays which bodies absorb, but those which they reject that gives them the colours they are known by, and in the same way people are specialised by their dislikes and antagonisms, whilst their good will is looked upon as no attribute at all. Henry continued in a more complacent mood. "'I once hinted my mind to her on a few things, as nearly as a battered frame dared to do so to such a forward piece. You all know, neighbours, what a man I be, and how I come down with my powerful words when my pride is boiling with scarn.' "'We do, we do, Henry.' "'So I said, Mistress Everdeen, there's places empty, and there's gifted men willing, but despite no not a spite i didn't say spite but the villainy of the contrary kind said i main and womankind keeps him out that wasn't too strong for her say passably well put yes and i would have said it had death and salvation overtook me for it such is my spirit when i have a mind a true man and proud as a lucifer you see the artfulness why twas about being bailey really but I didn't put it so plain that she could understand my meaning, so I could lay it on all the stronger. That was my depth. However, let her marry, and she will. Perhaps it's high time. I believe Farmer Boldwood kissed her behind the spear-bed at the sheep-washing t'other day. That I do. "'What a lie!' said Gabriel. "'Ah, neighbour Oak, how no said Henry mildly. "'Because she told me all that passed,' said Oak, with a pharisaical sense that he was not as other shearers in this matter. "'Ye have a right to believe it,' said Henry, with dudgeon. "'A very true right. But I mid see a little distance into things. To be long-headed enough for a bailey's place is a poor, mere trifle, yet a trifle more than nothing. However, I look round upon my life quite cool. Do you heed me, neighbours? My words, though made as simple as I can, mid be rather deep for some heads.' "'Oh, yes, Henry, we quite heed thee. "'A strange old piece, good man, "'whirled about from here to yonder as if I were nothing. "'A little warped, too, but I have my depths. "'Ha, and even my great depths. "'I might gear at a certain shepherd, brain to brain, "'but no, oh, no. "'A strange old piece, you say,' "'interposed the maltster in a querulous voice. "'At the same time you be no old man worth naming. "'No, no old man at all.' "'Your teeth ain't half gone yet, and what's an old man standin' if so be his teeth ain't gone? "'Weren't I stale in wedlock afore ye were out of arms? "'Tis a poor thing to be sixty, when there's people past four score, a boast weak as water.' "'It was the unvarying custom in Weatherbury to sink minor differences when the maltster had to be pacified. "'Weak as water, yes,' said Jan Coggan. "'Maltler, I feel ye to be a wonderful veteran man.' "'and nobody can gainsay it.' "'Nobody,' said Joseph, poor grass. "'Ye be a very rare old spectacle, Mortler, "'and we all admire ye for that gift.' "'Ah, as a young man, when my senses were in prosperity, "'I was likewise liked by a good few who knowed me,' said the maltster. 
"'Without doubt you was. Without doubt.' The bent and hoary man was satisfied, and so apparently was Henry Frey. That matters should continue pleasant, Mary Ann spoke, who, what with her brown complexion and the working wrapper of rusty linsey, had at present the mellow hue of an old sketch in oils, notably some of Nicholas Poussin's. "'Do anybody know of a crooked man, or a lame, or any second-hand fellow at all that I do for poor me?' said Mary Ann. "'A perfect one I don't expect to get at my time of life. If I could hear of such a thing, twould do me more good than toast and ale.' Coggan furnished a suitable reply. Oak went on with his shearing, and said not another word. Pestilent moods had come, and teased away his quiet. Bathsheba had shown indications of anointing him above his fellows, by installing him as the bailiff that the farm imperatively required. He did not covet the post relatively to the farm. In relation to herself, as beloved by him and unmarried to another, he had coveted it. His readings of her seemed now to be vapoury and indistinct. His lecture to her was, he thought, one of the absurdest mistakes. Far from coquetting with Boldwood, she had trifled with him, in thus feigning that she had trifled with another. He was inwardly convinced that, in accordance with the anticipations of his easy-going and worse-educated comrades, that they would see Boldwood the accepted husband of Miss Everdeen. Gabriel, at this time of his life, had outgrown the instinctive dislike which every Christian boy has for reading the Bible, perusing it now quite frequently, and he inwardly said, "'I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets.' This was mere exclamation, the froth of the storm. He adored Bathsheba just the same. "'We work folk shall have some lordy junketin' to-night.' said Caney Ball, casting forth his thoughts in a new direction. "'This morning I see them making great puddings in the milking pails, lumps of fat as big as your thumb, Mr. Oak. I never seed such splendid large knobs of fat before in the days of my life. They never used to be bigger than a horse bean. And there was a great black crock upon the brandish with its legs a-sticking out, but I don't know what was in within. And there's two bushels of biffins for apple pies,' said Mary Ann. "'Well, I hope to do my duty by it all,' said Joseph Poorgrass, in a pleasant, masticating manner of anticipation. "'Yes, victuals and drink is a cheerful thing, and gives nerves to the nerveless, if the form of words may be used. "'Tis a gospel of the body, without which we perish, so to speak it.'" End of chapter 22